It's no secret that the NBA in the mid-1970s wasn't a particularly great era. However, don't let that fool you into thinking that this era didn't still have its moments, because it certainly did. And in today's video, we're going to be looking back at the craziest of these moments. More specifically, we'll be looking at a game that was so wild, the league had to make a rule change to prevent a game like this from ever happening again. And of course, that game I'm talking about is Game 5 of the 1976 NBA Finals between the Boston Celtics and the Phoenix Suns. Boston was seen as the overwhelming favorites heading into the series as they were the best team in the Eastern Conference and arguably had the best starting five in the league. Phoenix, on the other hand, barely finished above 500 and were seen as lucky to have gotten past Golden State in a tough seven game series the round before. But to the surprise of many, Phoenix proved that they could hang with the Celtics and the teams ended up splitting their first four games. Game five, however, took us back to Boston and right off the bat, things were getting ugly for the Suns very quickly as they were down 36 to 18 by the end of the first quarter. However, a back and forth second quarter proved that Phoenix wasn't out of the game yet as they had pulled to within seven points late in the half before Boston finished the quarter on a 15 to six run, meaning that by halftime, the Celtics led Phoenix 61 to 45. Although that lead wouldn't last long as the second half was a different story entirely. Phoenix went on a 23 to seven run to tie the game at 68 before Boston eventually took a five point lead to end the quarter. But in the fourth, it looked like Boston was going to wrap up this game as they were back up by nine with three and a half minutes to play. But if we've learned anything from this game so far, it's to never count out the Phoenix Suns because right after that, the Suns took over. Paul Westfall hit back-to-back -back shots, cutting the lead down to five, followed by Ricky Sobers sinking a pull-up jumper from just inside the free throw line. With a minute left on the clock, Boston scores another bucket, which is then immediately canceled out by Paul Westfall on the other end. Next possession, Westfall pokes the ball out from behind Charlie Scott and gets fouled on the other end for an and one to tie the game at 94. Boston then gets called for an offensive foul and Curtis Perry goes one for two at the line to give the Suns their first lead of the game. Havlicek then gets fouled with 17 seconds left and converts one of his two free throws, once again tying the score at 95. Both teams would then have one more chance to win the game, but neither would capitalize on that opportunity, thus sending the game into overtime. But wait, look at Paul Silas. He's clearly signaling for a timeout before the clock expires, however the ref doesn't see him in time, which actually works out very well for the Celtics because they had no timeouts to begin with. So if the ref did see him, it would have been a technical foul on Boston and Phoenix would have likely ended up winning this game at the free throw line right then and there. Instead, we go into overtime. In overtime, the Celtics got off to a hot start and were leading by four after Jojo White drilled an open baseline shot with just under two minutes to play. It was at this point when Phoenix once again flipped the switch and started knocking some shots down, as Curtis Perry and Gar Hurd drilled two tough fadeaways that would tie this match at 101. Boston would then come up empty on their next possession, giving Phoenix an opportunity to run out the clock and either win the game with a make or go to another overtime with a miss. However, before they got the shot off, White poked the ball away from Sobers and all of a sudden, now Boston has a chance to win. So with three seconds left, they get the ball into Havlicek and it's an air ball, meaning that this game is now going into a second overtime. And no one knew it yet, but it's in this overtime period where the game goes from a great one to an all-time classic. But real quick, if you guys have been enjoying this video so far, then could you do me a favor and just hit that like button? It only takes one second and it really helps the channel out. So thank you guys. And now let's get back to the video. So we're now in double overtime, and for the first four minutes, it was pretty even between the teams. Boston held a one-point lead, and we pick up with a minute remaining, when Dave Cowens knocks in this shot to put the Celtics up by three. Or so he thought. Because instead, Cowens was called for an offensive foul, which was his sixth and final foul of the night. And while the Celtics didn't actually score here, they would come down and score on their next possession. So with 19 seconds now left on the clock, Phoenix once again has to get something going and they've got to do it quickly. Which is exactly what happened, as Dick Van Arsdale scored in just 4 seconds off of what I guess is supposed to be a sidestep. But regardless, it still went in, so let's just move on. Immediately after that, Jim Ard throws in a lazy pass to Havlicek that gets stolen by Westfall resulting in a mid-range bucket from Curtis Perry with five seconds to go. 
Yet another comeback from the Suns, and now all they have to do is get just one more stop on defense, and they will win this game. Touches it, it begins. Three seconds, Hondo off the glass, and he's got it with a second! Hmm. The Suns just can't make this easy on themselves, can they? Somehow Hondo hits that running bank shot at what appears to be the end of the game since fans started rushing the court and the Celtics were already back in the locker room. But that seems strange because if you take a look at the clock, it's very evident that there should still be time left. The refs would agree and they ultimately decided to put one second back on the clock, meaning that they now needed to clear everyone off of the court and get the Celtics players back on it, which wasn't going to be an easy task because once the decision had been made, Celtics fans were furious, toppling over the scorer's table amidst the chaos. One fan even started fighting the referee as if this was WWE. But nevertheless, after a few minutes, everything calmed down and the game was ready to resume. But with only one second to play and no timeouts remaining, the Suns were forced to start with the ball from under their own basket, meaning that Phoenix's odds of getting down the court and making a shot were very slim. Paul Westfall thought this as well, so he decided to make a 200 IQ decision by calling a timeout. Now, why would this be a good decision? Your team doesn't have any timeouts, and under the current rules, if a team uses a timeout that they don't have, then said team will be given a technical foul, meaning one free throw for the opposing team and possession of the ball. However, that's under the current rule. Because back then, technical fouls would still let the opposing team shoot a free throw, but the key difference is that the offending team would keep possession of the ball rather than lose it. Not only that, but they also get to inbound it at mid-court, making it a lot easier for the Suns to get a good shot off. So after JoJo White sank the technical free throw, making it a two-point game, the Suns start at half-court and are going to get one more chance to tie this game up. Won't start until it's touched, they'll have to throw it up. Garher, turn around, shot in the air, oh! it's good! It's tied again! I, believe I don't it. believe it! Gar Hurd knocked down what we now know as the shot heard from around the world, and somehow, this game is going to continue, making this the first finals game to ever go into three overtimes. And in this overtime period, both teams got off to a hot start, and the score was tied at 118 with 145 remaining. Jojo White then hits Glenn McDonald with a smooth dime under the basket to put Boston up by two. It was at this point when Boston decided to put their foot on the gas and they ended up scoring on their next four possessions to take a six point lead with 30 seconds to go. But just when you think the Suns are done for, they of course get a quick bucket from Paul Westfall to cut the lead back down to four. On the Celtics' next possession, it looked like McDonald was going to get another easy look right at the basket, but he turned the ball over and Sobers then launches a beautiful outlet pass to Westfall, making this a two-point game. But unfortunately for Phoenix, this is where their luck comes to an end, as they couldn't come up with a steal in the final seconds, and Boston ended up running out the rest of the clock, thus finally sealing the win. Boston would go on to close out the series in Game 6, securing their second title in three years, and while it was certainly a well-deserved victory, I'll always find it to be a bit of a shame that Phoenix didn't at least win Game 5, because if they had, it would have been the craziest comeback in NBA history. Not point-wise, obviously, as there have been multiple teams to come back from worse deficits, but just the fact that Phoenix came into this series as the underdogs, and all throughout Game 5, that's exactly what they looked like because they would put themselves in these situations that made you think, there's no way they're coming back from this, but then they somehow always would. And that's a great story. Now, don't get me wrong, because I'm not trying to take anything away from how amazing this matchup was, but all I'm saying is if Phoenix had found a way to pull it out in triple overtime, then I think this game would be getting even more recognition than it already does. But let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. Do you think this is the greatest game of all time? Because I definitely think it has a case. But that's it for today's video. My name is T-Pointer. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.